We're concerned in cryptography with designing schemes. There's many types of schemes for many different goals and they'll differ in different ways. But it's worthwhile to start by taking a broad look at what a scheme is and what are the issues involved in its um, design analysis and in determining definitions or precise ways of formulating uh, security. So here we are looking at a scheme for encryption. Its goal is to communicate information across an insecure medium and it'll do that based on keys. So it starts with the assumption that Alice and Bob are in possession of keys. When you specify a scheme, you say what constitutes it and this will be algorithms. So there's an encryption algorithm E and a decryption algorithm D. These algorithms have different inputs. The encryption one takes an encryption key KE, while the decryption one takes a decryption key KD. Think of algorithms as public. You can't or don't want to keep the description of an algorithm secret. Not only is that difficult, it's not pragmatic. Algorithms are standardized, implemented widely on the internet. One expects that the adversary can figure out what algorithm you're using. So the process by which you encrypt is not going to be secret. If that's the case, how can you possibly hide anything? The answer is that the keys are present and these keys can be secret. So we look to these keys as being the source of security uh, when used properly in the presence of public algorithms. We distinguish two settings. One, the most basic, is the symmetric setting. In that setting, the encryption and decryption keys are the same, and they're secret, meaning only Alice and Bob know them. At least a priori, the assumption is the adversary doesn't know them. Then there's the much more recent public key or asymmetric setting, in which only the decryption key is secret. So Bob has a decryption key, but what enables you to encrypt so that Bob can decrypt is entirely public. It's a little magical how this can happen, and it's where number theory entered cryptography. But we'll be starting with this more basic symmetric setting. If we go back to our TLS example, the purpose of the key exchange which begins TLS is to put us in a symmetric setting because it distributes a key K which functions as both KE and KD and we're now ready to utilize a cryptographic scheme of this form. So viewed in that way, what we're studying here is the development of the authenticated encryption element of TLS. But it will take many steps and go through many smaller primitives before actually reaching there. The adversary is present on the medium. The assumption here is that the adversary can see and possibly manipulate the ciphertext. And, but it's assumed to not have compromised the endpoints. So it does not at least a priori know the keys, although it will be up to the cryptography to ensure that the ciphertext don't leak keys to the adversary. When we look at a setting like this, let's take the symmetric one, for example, of course, one basic question is how did we arrive at a situation where these keys are present in the hands of these parties, but not known to the adversary? And of course, that takes work. But we're going to punt on that for now. We'll get to that only later although we have part of the answer already from our picture of TLS. This key is obtained through the key exchange and the key exchange in turn is using certificates and the public key infrastructure. When we have a scheme like this, we have a variety of concerns about it. The first concern is probably not the first that would come to mind without cryptographic experience. So we could first maybe consider the second. 
someone entering this would probably first think about how do I design the encryption and decryption algorithms? And then they would ask for any candidate ones that have been designed, how do I have confidence that they achieve whatever security goals we have in mind? Once you've put it that way, you see the importance of the first question, which is that if you have talking about these security goals, you need to know what they mean. And one of the important elements that we learn is that exactly how you define these goals is not only important, but quite tricky and subtle. There are many different ways to define security, and then you have to measure schemes relative to these definitions. In many ways, cryptography is the study of its definitions of security. They turn out to be that around which everything really revolves. So when we're designing these algorithms, what is it that makes them more complex than, say, a typical algorithm to solve some graph problem or a typical piece of software? It's that they have a goal of withstanding adversarial influence. They need to be able to perform their functionality even in the presence of someone who is actively attempting to subvert them. But the way in which this entity is attempting to subvert them isn't known in advance. We're not given the adversary strategy. The number of things it can try is effectively infinite. This makes it very hard to employ the typical manner in which algorithms are, are validated, which is testing. <coughs> testing is about throwing different inputs at the algorithm and making sure the output that comes out is what you would like. How are we going to validate an algorithm when we have to deal with um, subversive strategies that we can't anticipate? Well, to get a start on that, maybe we should back up a bit and look at a little bit of history. Now, one could spend an entire class on history uh, talking about the different ideas people have had, but we'll actually be very brief because um, modern cryptography is um, relatively different from these things. If you ask someone to design an encryption scheme, it's quite likely that they will quite quickly come up with a method and that will be a substitution cipher. Uh, history says that uh, Caesar had used these objects. How does it work? You take a function which maps symbols of your alphabet to other symbols. That function itself is a key, or which functions both as the encryption and the decryption key. Your alphabet here might be the, the set of all letters of the English alphabet. So A through Z. This function then associates to every letter another letter. To, and the letter associated to sigma is called pi of sigma. It has the important property that it's a permutation. A permutation means that it's one to one and on to, injective and surjective. Mathematically, if I give you an output like A, there is only one possible input and exactly one from which it might have come. You cannot have collisions. You can't have two inputs that both yield the output Z, for example. We select one such permutation. Ideally, we do so at random amongst the space in the space of all possible permutations of the letters of the alphabet. Once we have a permutation, we can use it to encrypt. So we now define the encryption algorithm, which uses pi as the key. And the way it encrypts a message is that it views the message as a sequence of letters. So the word cab is three letters long and it applies the permutation to each letter in turn. So you get pi of C, pi of A, pi of B. And you look up the table and you see what that gives you. And since C maps to Z and A maps to E, you get Z, E and then you get an A. Okay, that's the ciphertext, which means that's what's sent on the wire and that's what the adversary sees. At the other end, Bob is able to decrypt. What enables him to do that is that he also knows the key. Remember, the key is the table. It's the mapping pi. So he knows the table and will read it backwards. 
the inverse function of pi is written as pi inverse and when decryption works it applies pi inverse to each letter of the received word in turn so you get pi inverse of z pi inverse of e and pi inverse of a reading the table backwards you get back cab so very simple natural and as i said earlier it's something most people would kind of invent on their own if um, if you ask them to encrypt so if this is the case encryption is quite easy why is this not a solved problem effectively well the answer is security wise this doesn't work very well and to the extent that you can find newspaper puzzles which will show you a cipher like this in the sense that they'll give you some cipher text and say go discover the key or and decrypt the cipher text and you can you figure out that you can usually do that if you're familiar with these things that's relatively obvious but if not let's just spend a few um, minutes on that the way it would work is your adversary would get a cipher text the cipher text is a sequence of letters which are created by encryption so it's a bunch of encrypted words we assume they're created through a substitution cipher the same substitution cipher used throughout the text and we assume that encryption respects word boundaries in the text so for example here the first word is coxbx so we know that it's some five letter word that's been encoded through a substitution file cipher next you have a three letter word and we assume punctuation is also kept intact so the semicolons and colons and so forth are exactly what they are of course we could establish different systems but for the sake of this example that's what we're looking at your adversary doesn't know what the permutation or key is but it's supposed to decrypt this at first glance it may look hard until you realize that you can exploit the structure of the language and you can exploit the most important weakness and that weakness is that every time a letter is encrypted it's encrypted to the same thing so for example when you say coxbx there are two occurrences of x and now you know just by how a substitution cipher works that those decode to the same letter you don't know a priori what that letter is but it's the same you may not think that's a lot of information but the fact is that once you start putting a few things like that together it's surprisingly quick and easy to actually decode you will exploit structure of language in the following ways for example e is the most common letter so how would you exploit that it's typically true in text so look in your text and see which is the most common cipher text letter and whatever it is just make a guess that that's going to be an e your guess could be wrong but there's a good chance it's right if your guess is right you'll proceed further if it's wrong you'll figure it out english also tells us that the frequency of other letters is ordered for example next for most frequent are t a o i n s h r so you figure out the frequencies of different letters in the cipher text and make guesses based on this information as well there are other structural elements of the language you can exploit we know that words are encrypted um individually so if you see a single letter like t in the cipher text it's a one letter word but there are not many one letter words in english that immediately tells you a t is either an a or an i well that's a ton of information you've almost completely decoded one letter now you know that t also occurs in a host of other places you start plugging that in and you're well on your way now we could go ahead and do this but um i'm not sure it's worth it so i'll leave it to you as an exercise you can do it for fun and find the decoding of this um uh cryptogram in the process discovering the key the actual permutation that uh is used to perform the encryption our takeaway is really just that a system like that isn't isn't really effective now it's not immediately obvious what else you could do that's dramatically different 
And indeed, the history of encryption proceeded at first by making enhancements and modifications to substitution ciphers to make them somewhat better. There are many ways you can do that that are fairly productive. For example, also encrypt punctuation. Encrypt the blank symbol so that word boundaries are hidden. Um, it makes quite a bit of difference. It's quite a bit harder to decode when that's done, but it's still possible. You could then start encrypting in a context-sensitive way. So what a letter encrypts to depends also, let's say, on the previous letter. That makes decoding yet a bit harder. You'll see as you continue this that the amount of ciphertext you have is an important determinant of um, the adversary's ability to crack the system. If you have a very short ciphertext, even a substitution cipher might work quite well. But once you get a paragraph or two, it's, it's much easier to decode. It was a long time before things were significantly different in encryption theory or practice. And the next important advance we saw was when the uh, Germans introduced the Enigma machines in the Second World War. And these were enhanced glorified substitution ciphers just with lots of bells and whistles thrown in and many changing and movable parts and um, things like that. And it's a lesson of historical and um, other interest that uh, despite the German confidence in these machines, there was a very famous effort led by Alan Turing at Bletchley Park. Uh, we saw some of the people on that effort in the, in the first lecture, um, which succeeded in, in deciphering these codes and um, used that information to warn um, about German attacks and did influence the course of the war. So all that still leaves us with an uh, unachieved goal of, of really performing encryption well. In the um, uh, 20th century, Claude Shannon took a more theoretical look at this puzzle and in particular started asking about definitions. What, um, what does it mean for a system to be secure? And and did that in the context of a specific system, which was the one-time pad, which had been invented earlier by Vernum. How does this work? Our key is now a random string of some length little k. Remember this notation we saw before, 0, 1 to the power k is the set of k-bit strings. We pick a key k from them at random. And that means that each bit is equally likely to be 0 or 1, and the bits are all independent. That is our key, both for encryption and decryption, which both parties have and the adversary doesn't. When we want to encrypt a message, I'm going to assume the message itself is a k-bit string. And encryption is very simple. You simply XOR bitwise the message and the key. Decryption then becomes obvious you XOR the key back to the ciphertext. Remember, the decryptor knows the key. When it XORs the key back to the ciphertext, you can see that you get K plus K plus M, which equals M. So decryption works to reverse encryption. The interesting element is security. Now, what Shannon did is that he created a definition. He called it perfect secrecy. It was an information theoretic metric which captured formally some idea of an adversary from the ciphertext learning absolutely nothing about the message. It's impossible to gain any information about the message from the ciphertext. And then there was a proof. The proof said that this particular scheme, the one-time pad, satisfies this perfect security notion. Now we could get into how that notion works. In some ways, it's not particularly necessary because we will define computational counterparts of it. So in, in spirit, we will see it. But maybe it doesn't matter so much what it is as much as the fact that you can 
define perfect secrecy and that there are schemes that achieve it. So now again, one may ask, well, why aren't we done? The reason is that the one-time pad achieves this only as long as you encrypt a single message. That message is by default as long as the key. You could view that put another way as saying, I encrypt a number of message bits that's equal to the length of the key. Whether you view it as one message or many doesn't really matter so much. But effectively, perfect secrecy says that a bit of the key can't be reused. Once you use it, you're done. That creates a limitation that the length of the message has to be at most the length of the key. So if you want practical encryption schemes in which you have long messages, you need long keys. The first um, question one would have about that then is, okay, so the one-time pad fails to be perfectly secure when messages are longer than the key, if you try, for example, to reuse key bits. But perhaps there's another scheme that does better. But Shannon showed that there isn't. So perfect security requires that the length of the key be greater than or equal to the length of the message. Any scheme for which that isn't true there is an attack showing that it fails perfect security. By the way, putting bars around a string it returns the number of bits in it. So these things here denote the length in bits of M and the length in bits of K. Okay, so then we've hit another block, which is that if we want practical schemes, we either need very, very long keys or we... Um, need to sacrifice perfect security. The next step took um, further evolution in thinking and in some ways was a fairly radical departure because it changed the idea of, of what security meant. And it brought into the picture computation. It brought into the picture the idea that it's not the in-principle ability of an adversary to break a system that counts, but the amount of effort it puts in, where effort is measured by the number of computer cycles or the amount of computing time. So now security of a system will rely not on the impossibility of breaking it, but that breaking it will take prohibitively large amounts of resources in terms of time in computing. If your adversary had infinite time, it could break the system, but it doesn't. And this turns out to make a big difference because now you can use a fixed length key, say 128 bits, and you can encrypt pretty much as many messages as you want. Of course, we have to see how all that works, but, but it works out. So the philosophical departure here is that we no longer talk about an, the impossibility of breaking a scheme. Instead, we might say something like, consider attacks which run in less than 2 to the 160 steps on a basic computer. Their success probability is at most 2 to the negative 20. So if that's the case, I believe the system is secure. Why? Because I don't believe any reasonable adversary today, or even in the near future, has the capacity to run for 2 to the 160 steps. So if we can make attacks prohibitive, it's enough in a practical sense to achieve security. The cost is what counts, cost being measured as computing time, memory, or just plain the money required to buy the, or create the computers that are necessary. And this is how modern cryptography works. It's a computational um, security guarantee. The fact that computation is involved in this way has repercussions on the specialities and knowledge needed to design and study cryptography. So, Whereas well, as long as we dealt with ciphers and substitution ciphers and perfect security, it was just mathematics. We now need things like algorithms and computational complexity theory 
and that means we draw on computer science. Algorithms come in because we have to discuss not only the algorithms that process the data to encrypt and decrypt, but algorithms that attempt to break the system and so we have to see how slow or fast they are. Complexity because we need to understand which problems are easy and which are hard computationally speaking so that we can leverage them for security. And in part due to this, cryptography has moved from mathematics into computer science and now is mostly studied in computer science departments. One of the central elements of modern cryptography is going to be to be able to state more formally and mathematically what exactly is the security goal. Shannon took the first step at that when he defined perfect security. But we know that that's not the goal we can achieve. We have to achieve some kind of relaxation of that because we don't want to limit our uh, message lengths by key lengths. And this is not a simple question. It's, it's, it's um, subtle. It's also very interesting. We will spend a lot of time finding, developing, and justifying strong and precise notions of security. And as indicated earlier, in some ways, cryptography is the study of these definitions. And it's one of the most creative things cryptography has produced is not merely its algorithms, but it is these definitions, the ability to capture security in a, in a precise mathematical way. And thinking about these goals and understanding them is possibly the most important thing we'll be getting from the class. We will spend quite a bit of time on it, but let's at least get a little bit of a glimpse. It's perhaps surprising, at least once you've studied cryptography, how when it's approached in, let's say, a layman's perspective, you you think about how you design encryption schemes and yet don't give a great deal of thought to what exactly you're trying to achieve. In particular, the idea that people have in mind is just a vague sense that if an adversary is given a ciphertext C, which encrypts a message M under a key case of B, then we would like the adversary not be able to recover M. Of course, that seems the natural goal and many people might stop there and say, yeah, that's, that's the goal. What more is there to say? Well, what happens if the adversary would recover the first bit of the message just from the ciphertext? It didn't recover the whole message. It didn't violate your first bullet there, but it found the first bit. Is that a problem? Does that mean security has been violated? And that makes us scratch our head a bit because it's asking us to think about whether a certain attack is or is not violating what we'd like to call privacy and thus asking us, do I want to ask privacy to protect just the first bit, even if the rest of the bits um, are protected? The answer is yes. We will see many cases where one bit of the message carries important information. It's not intuitively appropriate if partial information like bits of the message leak. So somehow encryption should protect that bit. Once you've seen that, you can go further. What if an adversary cannot recover any individual bit of the message? Nonetheless, it manages to find the sum made or XOR of the first and last bits. Pretty weird. Should we care? And you might say, no, it doesn't sound like it'll be harmful. Well, there's two answers. First, I can give you examples where it is damaging. And second, somehow from a principal point of view, there's something wrong with that. We ought to be able to hide everything and we're not succeeding in doing that. So what we will be seeking is some kind of formal definition of privacy, which captures hiding everything you can possibly hide about the message, extending Shannon's definition to a computational setting. And we will have to give it 
justify it, show that in fact properties like the ones listed here are a consequence of it, much more is a consequence, but at least these things are, and gain some confidence in the actual definition. But definitions are not stable. Even as we speak, they're evolving, and one can always think about how to change them for the, for the better. Now, uh, we saw that when we approached the design of encryption schemes, it was very easy to start off. We wrote down substitution ciphers um, quite simply. You just have to write down a mapping of letters to letters and you have your encryption scheme. And they would be quite easy to specify and implement. The one-time pad also was a very simple algorithm. But once we go to this computational cryptography where you're trying to achieve security with a short key, even for encryption of a large number of messages with a computational security goal in mind, it's no longer that simple to just kind of write down some simple little thing that works. And the result is that cryptographers have taken a kind of Lego or modular approach. They build some simple primitives, which we'll call atomic, and then they process those, they transform them into the things we really want, which we call the high-level primitives. Encryption is a high-level primitive, but we won't build it from scratch. We'll build it from other atomic primitives. So we'll have to study atomic primitives, and then we'll have to study how you transform them into higher level ones. And this structure is quite important both to design and security. Already you can see that we are facing a task whose, whose complexity is increasing. We will now have to first study atomic primitives, then we'll have to study these transforms, we'll have to figure out which transforms work, and so forth. Now, when it comes to these atomic primitives, there are perhaps two main sources for them. One, you could say, is things that happen in nature. There are certain problems which complexity theory has identified which have some kind of computational hardness. The most simple is factoring a composite number. If I give you a large composite number, which is a product of two primes, and ask you to find the two primes, you can do it in principle. We know quite easily that we could simply divide n by every candidate divisor until we find p and thus q. But doing it, it turns out that is very slow, and doing it quickly is actually very hard. So factoring, as far as we know, is a difficult problem. So what? Well, cryptography would like to leverage that. The way they would leverage that is to somehow ensure that breaking encryption requires factoring. And the intriguing element is to make that link. How do you set up an encryption scheme with that property? Another way we get these atomic primitives is that cryptographers design them. There are things like block ciphers and hash functions, which are created through a set of techniques which are more an art, one might say, than a science, and uh, rely on principles like confusion, diffusion, and other things. And they yield these small, compact, fast structures that have various security properties. We will study those, try to understand how well they work, and, uh, and, and maybe acquaint ourselves more what they look like. Now, what distinguishes an atomic primitive from a higher level one? In some ways, it's not a precise or formal boundary, but there are not, um, the idea is to not have too many atomic primitives because they're hard to design and hard to validate. Um, there are actually quite a few of them around, but one might say that the central ones that are standardized and widely used are still relatively few in number. Confidence in these primitives is coming mostly by attempts to break them and how well they work or fail. There's no proof that factoring is hard. There's no proof that AES is a good block cipher. It's only because people have tried and failed to break it that we believe it's so. And atomic primitives are largely ones for which that's the case. <laughs>
Atomic primitives on their whole, on their own, rarely solve an end security problem. They will not tell you how to encrypt. They, they're little building blocks, but the goals that we want to reach are not directly solved by them. They'll only be tools in solving them. So what are higher level primitives then? They directly solve the problem of interest. So examples are encryption, uh, data authentication, signatures, session key distribution or exchange as we saw in TLS, many, many others. Each of these has a identifiable security goal of importance to applications. So these are what we're really looking for. Now, we saw earlier that we're going to use a Lego approach. That means that we want to take atomic primitives and use them as building blocks in order to build high-level ones. We expect the transforming process to be relatively simple. Uh, it's, it's going to use the atomic primitive in some way to create the high-level one. And uh, in that process, we want, crucially, that um, the security of the high-level primitive is justified with a proof that assumes the security of the atomic primitive. While the atomic primitive itself has no proof that it's secure, the high-level primitive effectively does have a proof, and that's why we use this approach. The proof relies on the assumption that the atomic primitive is secure, but this is better than having no link or no proof at all. Now, these proofs are um, not merely um, theoretical ideas. If you look at TLS, for example, it has many elements in it which are high-level primitives underlain by these kinds of proofs. So they have definitely penetrated to pack practice and their value is recognized as improving security guarantees. We'll talk a lot about proofs in the class. One of the things we'll be doing is building the definitions and proofs that are uh, going to be used. Okay, so let's talk a little bit then about what are the required um, background or skills. Now, despite the fact that cryptography is clearly widely useful and applicable in day-to-day -day life, its study is largely theory. The course itself is going to be largely formal definitions and proofs and a lot of mathematics. So one has to be prepared for, for that sort of um, material. The background needed is algorithms, theory of computation, probability theory, um, and uh, most of all, this sort of nebulous thing I'll call mathematical maturity. And what is mathematical maturity? It's the ability to think in terms of mathematical concepts, abstractions, understand what a proof is, and so forth. And that will be arising at, at many different levels. So here's a couple of little things to um, disambiguate your situation, maybe. Um, how do you feel about math? Which of these perspectives do you um, adhere to? And clearly, the if you veer more to the red than the black, um, this course will be more to your liking and, and fit. Um, what about this little test of your math background? Um, do you get it? And think about it a little bit. If you don't get it, well, we'll question whether it's a sense of humor or maybe um, a math background. 